All right. Well, hi, everyone. So we are here tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, BYOD. But first, I want to uh, introduce uh, myself. I'm Samantha Mora. I'm um, a presenter with EdTech Teacher. And I am really excited to have with me here um, Lisa Johnson, who is, I'm going to, I got to say this right, Lisa, Tech Chef for You, correct? On Twitter? Yes. Yes, and I'm yes. Going on, um, so we're going to be talking about BYOD tonight, but first I'd like Lisa to just introduce herself a little bit so uh, we know a little bit more about her. Go for it, Lisa. Sure. Um, thank you for the introduction. So, yes, I am Tech Chef for You um, on Twitter, and techchefforyou.com is kind of where I, I blog and, and put resources. Uh, I am a, <laughs> I have a varied background. Carl Hooker, the one to one that is K through Ted. However, it's only my second year with that sort of one to one environment, and a lot of my previous and you know encounters and and educational technology was based in schools that had kind of smatterings of carts and you know a little bit of BYOT, and a lot of the trainings that I do across the country kind of range of BYOT, BYOD, one to one. So. I do feel like this topic is very poignant and, and really pertinent for today and, and today's classrooms. Um, and I'm a mom yeah. <laughs> as well, a mom of two uh, what I call mobile natives. So <laughs> they're, uh, they've, they're that next generation of kids that are coming into classrooms that really know nothing other than mobile devices. And so I, I really try to share resources that I feel like will benefit um, them and other people in their shoes that are using these and benefiting our students coming into the classrooms. Awesome, awesome. And if you haven't checked out her stuff, her blog is just amazing. Her Twitter feed is just awesome. So she's a fantastic resource. So I'm going to start with sharing my screen as we get started. And once, uh, once we get going, I'll also be in the chat. So if you guys have questions, you can always ask um, uh, any questions that you have in the chat. We also have on our first screen, if you can see it now, um, both her Twitter handle as well as mine. So if you have other questions and you want to continue this conversation after the um, the webinar, you certainly can. And uh, again, we're going to be talking about uh, BYOD and oops, sorry, and uh, which is bring your own device or BYOT, which is bring your own tech. And um, you know, this is one of those issues that whether you have an iPad or a mobile device or a laptop. Um, Schools may, you know, in certain situations are not able to provide or don't want to provide or feel that it's better if the students provide their own devices. So it's a different kind of atmosphere than everybody being on the same device at the same time. And with that certainly comes some issues. So hopefully we'll be able to address those issues. And again, if you have questions, please ask them in the chat wing um, box below. This webinar will also be saved and archived as well as the slides are below the chat so you can follow along with our slides as well. And uh, with that I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Okay, so here we go. Or not. <laughs> Ooh, I love when that happens. <laughs> That's always fun. Hold on. Un momento. <laughs> Let's try that again. Um, Oh, let's do the Google Hangout then. And it's still doing that. Very interesting. Do you want to pull up yours and I'll go over the slide until... I can, uh, but if you talk, your face is going to come up first. I think you're sharing your Google Hangout window instead of the presentation window, maybe? No, I shared the desktop and it still doesn't want to come up. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Wait. Well, interesting. Wait, right, there it is. I see it. Nope, there it goes again. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Do you want here? Let's do this. Mm -hmm. Let me close out of. Do you want to close out of that window real quick and see what we can do? Yeah. See if you can open it up one more time. Just hang All on right. with this, guys. And if you're not sure, we're using Google Hangouts, which is an awesome tool for collaborating and um, communicating. And like all technology, it'll keep you on your toes. So. Okay, this may work for here, but I may have to actually bring up other slides. So for now, we might be okay. Great. So, you know, Samantha was kind of mentioning, we were talking about device-neutral assignments and, and kind of just, you know, every campus, every school is looking at different types of devices. 
and you know whether they're going to provide them, whether people are going to bring their own. And so you do have a lot of bring your own technology, and you have a lot of bring your own devices. And something to kind of keep in mind when you're a teacher or an instructor or an administrator is the ability to offer device neutral assignments. And I've got kind of a little what is a device neutral assignment, but essentially it's an assignment that anybody can complete no matter what type of device that they actually have. And that's really something to kind of keep in mind when you're building lessons and building curriculum and having students bring their own devices. Um, something else to kind of consider is what apps you're going to use and if they work along, let me see if I can actually do this again. Okay. Is that sharing my screen though? That seems to be sharing your entire Google Hangout screen. Yeah, I just want this. Is it sharing this now? Hmm. It looks yeah. like, yep. Yeah. It's got the presentation now? Yep. Yeah, I can see Oh, that. perfect. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, so um, I'm going to kind of move on to talking to a little bit about some of the tools. And you want to really, when you're selecting tools, you want to talk about tools that work cross-platform. There are a few people who have kind of started curating these things. One of them here is that's makelearn.org, and it talks about, well, you know, if you're going to have students create a digital story, then, you know, these are some apps in iOS, these are some Android apps, these are some online tools. And that does make it a little bit more tricky because you have, you know, this student over here is using iMovie, this kid over here might be using some sort of Android version of it. Um, this kid over here might be using Animoto. And so that does present a little bit of a teacher kind of constraint there. But, you know, some teachers are very comfortable with doing that. And honestly, those kids pick up the technology really quite easily. Another kind of great tool to look at this, if you're just trying to get an idea of what tools to use and what sort of products that kids can actually create, uh, Tony Vincent has amazing resources. One of them is learninginhand.com. And he's got web resources on the left, and then on the right-hand side, he's got mobile resources. So let's say you want to do an audio recording. Well, this would be a really great way to do an audio recording with this particular app. And if you've got a mobile device, then you might use this app to do audio recordings. Recently, he put out um, a PDF that was called iPad Apps that are also on Android. And so this was really helpful because when you have kids that both have iOS and then you have other students who have brought Android, you know that these are cross-platform. Essentially, they're available via iOS, they're available via Android. And he has further ones listed. But since we're focusing today on kind of creativity and collaboration, I wanted to make sure that those were the ones that you were getting to see. One of my favorite sites and uh, one of my favorite people is Wes Fryer, and he's got a great site called What Do You Want to Create Today? So if this is like, I really want kids to do a puppet show, or I really want kids to do a radio show, or if I really want kids to do some sort of ebook, this is a great place to visit. I'm going to pop into another screen so you can kind of see. If you click on one of the squares in that little tic-tac-toe, you're able to see, um, it, it kind of breaks it down. So it gives you ideas for workflow, and then what I really like is he gives you the ideas for tools. If you're using a laptop, these are tools that you can use. If you're on iOS, these are tools. If you're on Android, if you're on Windows, and so on and so on and so forth. One more tool I have to pawn. Um, if I'm just a teacher and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what tools are available for creation, what tools are available on Android, what tools are available via the web, Edge Shelf, I wish I had created it myself, it's a brilliant idea, um, <laughs> looks like this. So essentially I can filter by price, I can filter by age, I can filter by subject. Um, I can also filter by platform, which is really nice. So depending on what your students are bringing, you can do a sort of that nature. And then you can do a sort by category. So I'd like to look at you know, just image editors. And then it'll bring up image editors. So there's a lot of different tools. This is a really great way if you're just looking for tools. but what we've done here today for you is we've curated device agnostic tools. So it's not like, okay, well, Johnny over there has to use this app because he's got an Android, but Jane over there has to use, um, you know, a different app because she's got an iPad. So the beauty of a device agnostic tool is it doesn't matter what device you have. It will work across 
a device, a notebook, a PC, an iOS, smartphones, etc. So know that all of the tools that we're sharing today work cross-platform, so you don't have to worry about, oh, well, Johnny has this device, but, you know, Janet has this device. So we divided our information today into two categories, creation applications and then collaboration applications. So creation applications are obviously ones that you create something. <laughs> and, you know, we, we focus a lot of these, especially in high school and then when they're doing projects in middle school and elementary. You know, it's not about them consuming so much and, you know, playing games and things of that nature. It's really about what they can actually create. So my first one is, is one of my absolute favorites. It's Haiku Deck. And some of you may be familiar with it, some of you not. Uh, it has recently, within the past few months, it has opened up a web version. So now you have a web version as well as the iOS app. Honestly, they look, they look essentially the same. They work fairly the same. And it's a really great tool for presentation. So on the right-hand side, those of you... You know, when the iPad came out, there was a lot of concern over, well, kids are just being able to grab images here and there. We're not really citing anything. And, you know, what I love about this is the ability that because you're using Haiku Tech, so essentially it's a bunch of presentation slides. It's very similar to PowerPoint, very similar to Keynote, but it's just one photo and a little bit of text. So this opens up the ability to, now kids are not writing a lot of text on the PowerPoint slide. It also helps because it has a Flickr search, and so kids are able to use those images, and then it's already cited for them, so that kind of builds in that Creative Commons images. It also forces kids to use very minimal text, because I've seen a lot of even prezies and things like that where there's, you know, two paragraphs of text. I also really like the fact that you can use the speaker notes and I like the fact that you can post links in the speaker notes and really additional information. Also just the ability to share in multiple fashions so I can share as a haiku deck, I can also download as a power a PDF, I can download as a PowerPoint. So enough talk about what haiku deck actually is, I want to show you a few examples. One of my favorites is the idea of a six word story. This is actually a compilation from a teacher where they had kids each, so each student stories using Flickr. Here they're actually uh, cited, which really teaches them, you know, how to do this, where they are, because a lot of times kids don't know how to cite it. They don't know how to use appropriate images. And you can tell that they're really poignant when you see this. It's one photo and a little bit of text. And I think that speaks volumes about what you're able to do. So this would be something like a six-word story that they could actually put together. But wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> there is a website called Challenge Based Learning. And I'm going to show you just a little bit of this video because I want to show you what the power of taking a haiku deck, which is essentially just a bunch of slides, and what you would be able to do if you turn that into a video. So you can see here, they've actually asked questions, and these are really to kind of hook students. It's a great, excellent, excellent tool. So this is student use, you can see here, and they've actually got a ton of information, example, guiding questions, all matter of different things that you can do with Haiku Deck. So don't think that you can't app smash. You can do all kinds of things with a Haiku Deck. And it's really an interesting thing. Haiku Deck, if you actually follow their blog, has a lot of great just ideas and inspiration. One of them I really enjoyed was they took the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and they turned it into a haiku deck. So you can see right here they've taken the text and really broken it up because that's a long speech and it's got a lot of meat to it. So this is a nice way to kind of chunk it and make it a little bit more accessible to our students. 
What I've started doing is I've started taking haiku decks and actually using them as professional development. So this is what a published haiku deck will look like. You've got your slides here, and I can go through um, you know, different slides. This is actually a haiku deck about Nearpod, and it's just best practices. Uh, over here, you've got speaker notes. So what I do is I write a lot of different information. I also include links and other information here. So like, for example, um, let me pull up one. Right here you have some more examples that they can go find. So it's not just a static presentation. It leaves people with the ability in the speaker notes where you can actually add links. This could actually be a link to a Google Doc or a Padlet board to get more information about the Padlet or about your Haiku deck. Right here you've got um, thing links that are asked. You've got um, more information about SAMR and allowing students to drive assessment. So I really do feel like using it to its fullest makes it an excellent tool and because it works cross-platform there's nothing really you can't do with it. It's not just static photos and slides because you can add the links and you can add the text. And this is just another example of you know adding a Google Doc within here allows people who are looking at your presentation to then add their own ideas rather than just having you know your static images. My next favorite one is TAC. If you're familiar with S'more, uh, S'more recently changed their product. It's essentially what S'more is and what TAC are, are their web scrolls. So, you know, picture the olden days where you have a scroll of content, you know, and you're rolling it out. This is the same thing. It's a presentation where you've got images, video, text, audio. You can actually embed maps. You have sharing and all matter of different things and you're able to scroll through it. So if you have students who are working, we've had students use this on the iPad, we've had students use this on the computer, and it is the same, very similar experience because it is just a web tool. So what does it actually look like? That's what I'm excited to tell you about. Uh, I met one of the people who worked with TAC over when I was at South by Southwest EDU, and I was really thinking, you know, what's a great way to when I go to a conference and sometimes a blog isn't always the best way because I want to have a, a certain visual element to it. So this is what my tack looked like for um, South by Southwest. So what I was able to do is I, I linked all of the items that I attended. This is uh, Carl's Digital Zombie Apocalypse so you can upload images here. You know I had some information. This actually linked to um, a blog I wrote more about it. You can add in your own images, and then you can add in images, text, etc. And you've got bullet points. So you can actually customize your text a little bit more than what you would be able to do in other apps. And you can see how when I find videos, I can just copy the link in and it'll embed it. So everything's here. It's not really kicking me somewhere else. And I can just scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll through the information. Now, this is actually a student example. This was um, one that was featured on TAC's main website. And it's interesting because what our Latin teacher at the high school does is she allows students to kind of choose the tool that she, they feel best fits their projects. So this one, they were studying Masada in Latin. And this one, this particular student wanted to talk about archery and some of the tools that were used in that time frame. So he's got a brief history here. And it's pretty in depth. And then he's brought in a YouTube video. And then he's also got some information. Now, when you bring in photos and you bring in more than one photo, it actually creates kind of a, a slideshow effect. And you can keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. This is a video that he himself created. And what's interesting about these, the only downside is because TAC is a way to, you know, you can put in videos and all these sorts of things, but they have to be hosted somewhere else. So if a student was to create like an iMovie or um, a trailer or an explain everything or anything like that, they would have to upload it to YouTube or Vimeo first before they were able to embed it nicely. And then they've got more and more information. These are his own photos that he brought in about how he actually made a bow and arrow after researching it. And even more information about it here. So you can see what this would look like as an actual student project. 
based on kind of some of the information I've given you in this webinar, I've also created a TAC, same sort of thing. Uh, you can see some of the resources I've already shared with you, and this is another nice way. It's a nice takeaway um, for people who don't always want to go through everything. They just want to get some quick links, um, and you can kind of see that I have links, bullet points, etc. So that's another version of TAC, but TAC could be anything you want. They've got all matter of different colors of, you know, fonts and colors and things of that nature. So we have a question in the chat. They want to know why yeah, sure. is TAC better than S'more? Well, um, hopefully you don't work for S'more because I love I love both TAC and S'more. Um, they're not they're not better than one another. Um, TAC you can actually create TACs without creating an account. Um, they're auto saved that URL for a year. So that is nice for students. You don't want to deal with accounts now. The one I showed you was a high school student, so you know accounts are really easy in that regard. And you know, they also want to take them with them and you know have an e-portfolio. The reason SMORE has changed their um, educational package to limit you to five free SMORES. And I don't mean like, you know, graham crackers and chocolate, although that sounds enticing right now, um, <laughs> and marshmallows. Um, they, they limit you to only creating five. So for a student, that might be fine. For a teacher, I mean, I, I create a lot of resources. And so to be limited to only creating five and then having to use another tool or um, purchasing their educational pricing, it, I, I just kind of made the swap over to um, to use tax. So there's nothing against more, and I, I like both of them, and they essentially do very similar things. I just I I think that TAC offers the ability to do unlimited um, tax at, the, at least at this point in time. That's a good question. Yeah, and that, that's really good to know. That's really good. So uh, my next one is an oldie but goodie, and you might wonder why I have put this in here because Big Huge Labs has been around for a very long time. Well, the reason I put this in here was up until recently, I did not realize that it worked on the iPad. So obviously Big Huge Labs is available via the web, and they have all of these awesome templates listed here. I listed like the four or five that I felt were the the best ones that could actually be used for projects. Like some are kind of fun, like, oh, you can create a puzzle, but I don't, I don't feel like that's as useful as some of the ones I'm showing you right now. So you can upload your own photos to Big Huge Labs if you've used it before. Um, the experience on an iPad via the web is very similar. And you know, you can add in your text and it's kind of got like a little bit of a template. I will tell you best practices. I found that if you're using a template, I would tell the kids what the, you know, what pieces are part of the template and have them kind of type in their text somewhere else just so they can copy and paste it, just in case, you know, if they lost the browser or something happened, they wouldn't lose their, their work. And then you're able to download your photo, and yes, it's just a photo, but I'm sure you've seen Greg talk about app smashing. One of my absolute favorite apps is ThingLink, and, you know, honestly, there's nothing you can't do with ThingLink. So, while I'm talking about Big Huge Labs, what I'm really talking about is the ability to create a photo that can then be augmented in some form or fashion. So if Big Huge Labs was just a tool that we were creating like movie posters and you know things of that nature with, it'd be okay. And But it's not as amazing as when you're able to link things on top of it. So this is an example of Big Huge Labs um, on the left. This is Fugal Fun, um, she's actually, if you've ever seen Mrs. Fugal Sad on the Dryden art page, she has the most amazing elementary iPad art page I've ever seen. And she was using Big, uh, Big Huge Labs. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what app she used to create this image. I'm wondering if it's like a paper by 53 or something of that nature. She's amazing with that. So you can see what just one of these little magazine covers would look like if they just created some, you know, an image somewhere else on the iPad and then you know brought it into Big Huge Labs. But what I've done is taken it one step further. So I'm gonna pop over here so you can kind of see. So now I've taken this movie poster template that I created in Big Huge Labs and now I can link things on top of it. So because it's a movie poster I've just given you some examples. So right here you could have a Google Doc or a TAC and maybe have like a movie treatment. And movie treatments are very specific. Um, it's a specific type of writing that students would do about their movie. And I've got that linked here. 
Um, another idea might be that I could do like an iMovie trailer for my movie poster and then I could link that here as well. Um, another idea might be that, let me move this up so you can see. Another idea might be that I use Crokit and I do like a quick little 30 second radio spot and I link that here as well. Uh, a Google Form. I really believe in authentic feedback for students and so Samantha's going to be talking a little bit about Padlet and I think using Padlet or using a Google Form and linking it to a student's work that's published online with a very clear um, questions or some sort of rubric that people who are looking at this can actually provide them feedback. I think that's a really amazing authentic learning experience and I think that's something that we can uh, teach our students to do. And then this is another example. Um, if you're you know, into Minecraft, I think it would be amazing to do some sort of interactive movie set using Minecraft or SketchUp and then link it here. And then I had one more idea. Um, Poplet is also cross-platform, so you have a web version of Poplet. You also have an iOS version of Poplet. And it's like, like a mind mapping tool. And so this might be another thing where now I've chosen a character from my movie and I've done you know, like a little mind map of those and I've linked it here. So Big Huge Labs is just a way to create a movie poster or to create you know, all the kinds of wonderful things that we love about Big Huge Labs. And then I can link all of these other tools like TAC and other things on top of it. And actually, let me come back over here. So are there any questions on that, Samantha? Nope, we're just... No questions on that, but I, yeah, I love big, huge labs, and I love the idea that you can just really have our, you know, our students express themselves in so many different ways, and then you can bring it together by creating, you know, the thing link, um, uh, tap, not taps, um, triggers, you know, that bring you to other tools. So you can bring everything together. So it's a really cool use of images. I like to call them nubbins. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't know why. It's always fun um, in trainings when I call the, they're they're like little interactive nubbins. Yeah. So um, I will tell you if you have not used ThingLink recently, they have changed their little nubbin triggers, um, and now they have like numbers and different things like that. So um, go over to ThingLink and check that out. It's pretty darn awesome. Yeah, and I like the numbers because then you can create different steps, so people yes. know which ones to hit first, second, third, instead I, of just little targets. So. I love. It. I know. It's a it's a great tool. Thing link. Yes. Link them also. Uh, it's it is. I was like I, I don't work for Thing Link. Um, I, I'll just put that out there. But um, <laughs> I do not receive endorsements from them. But um, they're pretty they're pretty stellar. So Snap Guide. Uh, if you no. are <laughs> in the in the virtual world, if you'll just put your hand up. Um, if you love Pinterest. I love Pinterest. Um, I curate all matter of different resources on Pinterest. Even if you just flat out Google iPad lessons, I have a lot of resources um, on Pinterest boards. And what SnapGuide does is it's kind of the extension of Pinterest. So many times when you use Pinterest, you'll click on like an image and it may just be an image or it may be a blog with very little information about how image. So it's like these awesome things I'd like to do, but I have absolutely no idea how to do them. So SnapGuide kind of fills a need. What SnapGuide allows you to do is you essentially create step-by-step -step tutorials. And each step of the tutorial could either be a photo, a text, or a video. Now, why I'm sharing this tool is recently they opened up a web version just like HaikuDex did. So they started out as an iOS app, and it is amazing. And I will tell you right now, if, if you stop and do something, you will get sucked into it, and um, you'll start doing all kinds of wonderful things with it. But they've also opened up a web version, and so it's, it's the beauty of you can use it and do anything you want with it. It could be very easily used for procedural writing. Because you can share a snap guide with a URL, you could then add it to a thing link or add it to a tag. So all of these tools, because they're device agnostic, play very nicely with each other and you could do a lot of different cool app smashing. So what does it actually look like? That is the million dollar question. Um, I'm going to show you a few. So 
I really love the idea of not everything being digital. So this is how to make an osmosis foldable. Uh, foldable. I love foldables. I think they're still fun. But, you know, I find in the classroom sometimes kids don't always pay attention or sometimes you do centers and things like that. And so it's really valuable to have a digital resource to support that so teacher doesn't have to want, want, want over and over and over again. So what a guide looks like when it's published is um, sometimes they will have supplies. So you can see here, you decide what supplies they will have. Sometimes these supplies could be like fun, like you need creativity or you need, you know, apps or whatever the case may be. You can embed these on blogs and then you can start the guide. So when you start it, it plays kind of like a magazine. You have step one of seven here. Um, so obviously to create this osmosis fo foldable, you might want to open a notebook. And then we fold the paper. And then you can see step the three of seven and so on and so forth. Now each step, this could actually be a video or it could just be a longer piece of text or it could be a photo as you see. And then she's got the glue stick. I don't know what's going to happen next, guys. I think there's the scissors. <sighs> so awesome. Okay. Um, that's one of them. You know, I also find that in sports this is really valuable. So this is how to play bounce ball. Um, and you can kind of see. Now, this could actually be a video. So rather than just having bounce the balls, they could actually be bouncing them in this sort of um, vignette here, step three of seven, step four of seven. I love these for creative writing as well. So um, I'm sure some of you really enjoyed um, the fourth. May the fourth be with you. And uh, so this is how to survive an attack. And I love Lego. So this is kind of like a Lego digital storytelling. So they've set up these little creatures and they've taken pictures and um, they've written this really clever little wear proper, you know, eyewear and et cetera. This could be a procedural text. This could be anything. And I, this could also actually be like a little stop motion animation within this little photo right here. So you kind of get the general idea of what this looks like. One of my favorites uh, was how to become the master of procrastination in 22 steps. This teaches a lot of voice and humor. Um, this is actually her English project. Um, <laughs> and so it, it kind of had a lot of sarcasm in it and I appreciated that. It's another way for students to communicate and so this one talks about never writing down your homework, and it talks about um, watching a lot of YouTube videos, and um, you know eating junk food, and so on and so forth. I love that she's actually done her own speech bubbles. There are tons of these that are available for you. This one is how to solve um, differential equations. So what they've done is they've taken Notability and they've done screenshots in Notability, and so then you can see this would be a very easy way to share. Step-by-step um, -step guides, math, whatever you want to do with your students. I feel like this is sometimes easier and less daunting for teachers than creating full-blown videos. So this might be another um, option for you. And then I have a bunch more examples here. And uh, I even share this with my sister-in-law. And so she's very crafty and artistic. And so if you would like to learn about laundry room art or all those kinds of things, or if you just have a hobby where you would like to share your knowledge, um, there's awesome kinds of things out there. So these are just a few of them. And then on to ThingLink, because I think ThingLink kind of culminates a lot of these creation tools because it is one tool that allows you to thread all of them together. If you're familiar with ThingLink, you essentially upload one image like I did with the Big Huge Labs, and you can add text pop-ups, and you can add links. Now, links could be really anything on the web, so really think big. They could be a tack. They could be um, a snap guide. They could be any one of these tools that we're sharing with you today. And then embedded. Big ideas, you know, link away. These could be great ePortfolios. There's a web version, and there's an iOS version. I will tell you, I'm partial to the web version. The web version does also work on iOS. So that's just my preference, um, just because I, I've kind of grown accustomed to it and I, I work back and forth like that. But it's not to say that you can't use the iOS app. So I'm going to show you, um, I've got two, well, this is one example I've done um, actually at uh, the summit in Boston. So this was one I, I talked about designing thinking with ThingLink. And so these are all the different types of things. You know, you can have an assessment with ThingLink. You can use this as actually um, to share homework with teachers. So 
If you go to this thing link, this will actually take you to other examples of thing links. Um, for learning stations, professional development, all matter of different things. And then over here I have um, a today's meet. So you could actually have a today's meet where students go in and answer questions. You could have a TAC. You can have all matter of different things. I actually have a Padlet board here. Um, Samantha's going to talk about this, but I'll show you kind of what that might look like. So I had a Padlet board, which was a KW wall. So when people went to this thing link, I wanted to know, what do you know about thing link? What would you like to know about thing link? So there's really nothing you can't link. So please don't just think, oh, it's just I've got to just link, you know, static videos and I've just got to link static um, URLs. There's a lot of interactivity that you can really do with this tool. Um, this video I'm not going to show you, but it's linked here. It's a really great little like three minute tutorial that gives you a really great frame of reference of what you can do with ThingLink. I do have two examples of ThingLink and the reason I want to share these two is I feel like they're very robust in what they've done with them. The first one is uh, one of my favorite people. Uh, she is Mathy Cathy and if you teach middle school math or high school math you absolutely have to visit her website because it is chock full of amazing resources. This is one of the ThingLinks that she's created she creates all of her thing links in Keynote. So she just does a Keynote slide, saves the Keynote slide as an image, and then uploads it. What I love about this particular Keynote um, or and thing link that she's done, so this is a picture of the graph. And you can kind of hover over and learn a little bit more about the graph. But what I love is she actually takes you to the live graph in Desmos. So Desmos, um, everybody who is not math may tune me out right now, but Desmos is a tool that has an iOS app as well as a web version, and it's essentially a free graphing calculator. If you log in with a Google account, you can share um, graphs that you create with a specific URL, and that's essentially what she's done, and so that's why I think this thing link is so powerful. She's also got quizzes that they can go to. This one right here is a teacher's project, and so what this teacher has done, rather than creating, you know, all of these documents that kids never read, um, especially if they're handed out in a packet, she said, this is step one, this is your topic, this is step two, this is your research, this is step three, this is your um, presentation. And she's got the rubric here, and all of these are um, Google Docs. So it's a great way to app smash and provide all of these resources. She's got key questions and, and all of these sorts of pieces available. They've got a research form here um, you know, that gives them all of the information for their sources and, and being able to kind of um, curate that for them. So it's a one-stop shop. This is probably my very favorite teacher-created thing link because it really shows what you're able to do with it. And now we are going to move to collaboration, and I'm going to hand it over uh, to Samantha to uh, share some of those resources with you. All right. Sorry about that. I was chatting. <laughs> I was in the chat chatting. Okay. So well, do we are. have any questions? Do you want me to answer anything? No, we were just saying how super cool ThingLink is and how much we absolutely love it. And um, that Desmos is really cool. And I already bookmarked Matthew Cathy's blog on my own uh, <laughs> account because, oh my gosh, it's always great to find really good uh, math resources. And um, I just think, you know, ThingLink is just amazing for bringing together. Um, um, ideas that you want to express and get out there to your students and then have your students also create them so I just it's just a fantastic tool I love tools like that um, just amazing we kind of we call them evergreen tools or evergreen apps because you can use them across the curriculum across grade levels I could see kindergartners you know accessing it just as well as high school you know honors history classes yep. um, depending on how you set it up and I think what's also great about ThingLink is, you know, we don't always think linearly. So it's wonderful to see something that um, puts together all these tools and all these tools. So yes, so now we are on. So yes, so now we are on. Oh, we're getting some echo. We're getting some echo. I wonder why. I wonder why. Do you mean turn off my mic for a second? Um, Let me do that. Um, let's see. Yep, I think it's gone. Okay, so there's a little echo there. Um, 
Okay, so we're talking about collaboration now, and we are going to uh, talk a little bit about really one of my favorite, favorite tools, which is Padlet, and I know Lisa has already mentioned it. Um, Padlet is just fantastic because, again, it is device agnostic. You can be on a, on a laptop, desktop, a Mac, a PC, a Droid device, anything that accesses the Internet, and it allows people to come together. And it also allows people to come together where they don't necessarily sign in, although they can, um, which, you know, sometimes it those are things that block us from getting stuff done in education because do we need an account for the students? How do we sign in? Is there a cost? And Padlet answers a lot of those questions. So I just love this wall that was created at one of my workshops. We were just talking about great videos for learning. We were just gathering them and trying to share as many as we could in like 10 minutes. And each person was able to... Um, put up a video and notice how it actually shows within the Padlet. It's a wall that you post things onto. Whether And the thing could be, I'm going to go to the next slide, the thing could be a link, which is can also be a YouTube link, um, or a document, so you can put documents up there, and you can even use the camera. Camera always scares me because, you know, it's always one of those ugh, what's going to happen kind of moment. But, you know, you try to prep and work with your students ahead of time to um, to make sure, you know, that they put appropriate things up. But going back to that one slide before, you can't quite see it in here. But not only did they put videos, they actually also put in websites. And when you put in the link in the upper right-hand corner, it's um, physics simulations. Um, you can If you put in a link that has a visual that's easily translatable, it will show up as well. So it's a really visual tool that allows you to collaborate and bring um, a lot of different um, elements together. And again, not having to worry about signing on and all that is great. So I absolutely love this. This, um, this next slide, this was created by Susie Brooks in Massachusetts. And again, her blog is just tremendous. This is from um, her entry on Padleting Together. I love that title. And it's a bingo card. And she put up all sorts of great ideas of how you can use Padlet. Because as I always say, it's never about the tool. It's about what you want to do. Then go out and find the tools that help you get that done. So just in different ways, I just pulled out some of the squares from her um, from her uh, beautiful bingo card. So just like using it as a homework alternative to collect responses. Many times I've had students use Padlet where they can either put in text responses, video responses, any type of response. And it's a great way to collect homework and also share it because this is the collaboration piece with each other as well. So it's just fantastic. Uh, we even did a trick when they were sharing homework once. They had to answer questions, but they didn't want other people to see their answers until they came into class. So we turned moderation on because you can actually moderate the comments. So everybody did their homework, you know, the night uh, at home, at night at home. And then when they came in in the morning, right at the start of class, we hit uh, post, you know, we hit, um, you know, the moderation button and we posted all their responses so then we could see it all at once. And it was great because that way they didn't feel that their responses were changed by anybody else's. You can also post videos and have kids respond and make predictions. Oh, and one thing people forget is, I'm just going to go back to this slide real quick. This one is set up so that it's wherever you put stuff and you can move it around. You can also use Pad, but there's a, just a button off to the side. You can change it so it posts stuff, content, in the order in which it is put up. So it could also become kind of like a, a Twitter wall or a... Um, today's meet kind of wall, so everything is sequential. So that's kind of interesting, too, that you have that ability. So I absolutely love Padlet. I'm just going to peek at the chat real quick. Um, I see Emily asked, um, is Padlet an app or web-based? It is web-based, but works beautifully on the iPad and Droid devices through a web browser. I like to open up Padlet in Safari on my iPad, and then I do make a home button out of it so it looks like it's an app on my iPad but it is actually a website that I just created a home button for so yeah it is just an amazing tool that's a great question Emily thank you um, oh yes and Padlets can be embedded in anything Google Sites and all sorts of wonderful places and TAC as we just saw so that's just fantastic so and if you have any more questions about Padlet or any of these we'll 
we should have a few minutes at the end. We we uh, we can definitely talk about it some more. So obviously another fantastic tool for collaboration that is um, that that works across all devices is Google Drive. And honestly, we could spend an entire hour just talking about Google Drive and Docs and Sheets and all that yummy stuff. So I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned it, but I also wanted to tell you if they haven't checked it out in the past five days, six days, sorry, um, May 1st or April 30th, they came out with new apps for both Droid and iPad. So that if you're using Google Drive, it now will, when you click on a document, it will open up a separate app called Docs. That's free. And, or if it's a, a spreadsheet, it will open up sheets. So it's actually splitting out the different parts. And thank goodness, Slides is coming soon. So the wonderful ways in which you can collaborate on um, presentation mode in Google Drive, you'll now be able to do with Slides. So I have a feeling that they're actually going to be doing, um, they're going to add more features to all of these uh, apps now. But again, it's a fantastic tool because if you're a Google Apps for Education school, you'll notice how things um, just can go into Google Drive to share in a variety of ways and then come out of Google Drive. And I did write an article just May 1st because it just came out on introducing the new Google Drive apps. It takes about two minutes to read and the best part is I put all the links in there so you can get to them easily. So Google Drive really is just a fantastic tool for collaboration. And um, you know, as I said, many schools who are Google Apps for Education also um, are looking at iPads and then Chromebooks coming in or Droid devices. So it really does help that you can use these really strong tools um, across all of your devices. Uh, let's see what else we have here. So we have something called Blend Space, really just another great visual way of curating and distributing content because we know that um, you know we it helps if we can help our students think about our content in a variety of ways. And if we can distribute information to them in a variety of ways, we have them over a long period of time, it keeps the information fresh. So their eyes can be working with maybe a snap guide and then maybe with something else and then a Padlet. And perhaps you'll check out something like Blend Space. So it's just another fantastic tool and you can see all of the elements that you can put into it. Um, you can also see that you can insert content from anywhere, all these wonderful tools like Prezi's and, and um, Khan Academy even and EduCreations and Wikipedia. So all of these fantastic tools can be brought in here. And um, again, it's just a fantastic tool. And it's one of those things when you're looking at any of these tools, you want to you know, kind of make this, some decisions. How can we use this well and quickly. I mean, I don't know about you, I want a tool that I can say, oh, I can use that Monday. So you can look at all of these different tools and see different features that you like or don't like or can use or can't use. Another feature that this one has that I think is really wonderful is that because they sign in, you can track engagement and assessment. And it becomes another way for you to um, find out information on your students and have your students um, you know, uh, access your information and show what they know. So just another fantastic tool out there. And I think we are actually up to Trello, which is going to, I'm going to hand it back to Lisa. Okay, um, sounds good. I am, um, you can see my screen, right? Yes? Yeah, right. we can see we see you actually. Okay, there we go. Oh, well, now you see my screen. All right, cool. I just want to make sure. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I I do want to tell you about Trello. It's awesome. I um, really really like Post-it notes, and I really really like you know trying to kind of keep everything organized. You know, I've got a lot going on. I've got two small boys. Um, you know, I I work you know, at, at home, I work at night, I work, you know, all kinds of different things, and then, you know, on top of that, maybe I want to do some house projects or, you know, the, uh, anything. So what Trello is, is it's a collaborative uh, board that allows you to manage, like, tasks and to-do lists and things of that nature. You can assign tasks to people. It's got a Google sign-in, so uh, Google schools and things like that. I see, I see this being used uh, well, actually three different ways. I see this being used personally, 
So just, you know, for personal things, when I go in in the morning, you know, I have like a Trello board for the high school and it's like things I need to do now, things, you know, if I have a few minutes, you know, I can start working on or things I've already done because it makes me feel productive. Um, <laughs> like I've done something, you know, over the few months and make sure that, you know, I can kind of see what I've done. Uh, you can add your own checklist. You can include images, links, docs, etc. Now, what does this actually look like? That's what I want to show you. So right here, when you log into Trello, you can create as many boards as you want. This one is actually one from the amazing Rafrans Davis. Um, she uses uh, Trello for professional learning communities. So they've got goals here for the you know um, community. And then this is kind of ongoing tools, and then you've also got completed things. And within any one of these little white little things right here that looks like a, like a little index card, you can drag them over to like, okay, now it's a goal, now it's ongoing, now it's done. You can assign them to different people. You can add a doc that you know you want to be available within that to-do list. You can actually assign due dates for these things to be done. You can color code them you can do anything. The beauty of this is it works via the web and it works on iOS as well. So there's really nothing you can't do with it. This one right here, a teacher is using, the, the image is kind of hard, but I'll tell you, um, if you click on this one, it's really great. We have a teacher at one of our uh, campuses, our elementary campuses, that's working with passion projects. And so kids, you know, they, they come in and they're at different levels of their inquiry and research, and so this is how she tracks. Okay, well, these kids are on step one. These kids are on step two. These kids are on step three. And as they move, she drags them under a different step, and this is also a really great way for, you know, she'll bring it up at the beginning of the class. Okay, where are we at our, you know, inquiry and our research and our presentation, and she's able to drag and drop them, and there's more information about both of these um, projects here. So Trello is, is really, really great. I will tell you, if you just really need to latch on to something to get your uh, life organized um, or you know you want to work on a project with students I really feel like this is something that some students are really going to latch on to. We actually have one um, we do our conferences and different things of that nature and um, we you know we have different tasks that are assigned to people and resources that are available for that so I do really feel like it's a very robust and it's free it's free to create an account it's free to start working with it. Now this one I'm not going to go too in depth. This is just kind of like a, a last nugget for you. And this is really for teachers. So common curriculum, uh, Samantha, I, I'm located in Texas. All of you lis listening here, I am in Austin, Texas. We are one of, I believe, four states that are not Common Core. Believe me, this is an unfortunate title because Common Curriculum has nothing to do with Common Core. Um, so, so just know that what it really is is it's kind of like a Google Calendar on steroids that is essentially a lesson plan and it's collaborative. So I really see, you know, if I have a PLC and we want to have collaborative lesson plans, so, you know, picture a Google Calendar similar to that, but within the Google Calendar it's really easy to have videos, PDFs, documents, all of the resources that I would need and then I can drag and drop and move them around. I can also tag it with um, TEKS because we're in Texas or your Common Core standards. They actually do have those built in so you can tag each lesson. So, you know, six months into the semester I can say, wait a second, you know, I'm 50% I'm through the semester but I've only covered, you know, 30% of the TEKS and so you've got all of that sort of information. I do see the potential too because I'm an instructional technology specialist so I work and do a lot of planning with people and, and technology integration within the campus and so you know, if they said, here's what I'm doing, let me share it with you, it'd be really easy for me to add some other resources that I felt were valuable rather than kind of going back and forth and emailing things. I also see the potential for, you know, we have a lot of first year teachers that come in. I, my first year, I had no curriculum, no scope and sequence, um, no mentor, <laughs> uh, an outdated textbook. And so having a valuable tool of this nature, I mean, I, I really do feel like is a very, very uh, useful for teachers. The last thing I just want to mention um, that exists, and I'm going to open this up in another tab so you can see it. So if you are looking for tools that work on the web as well as an iPad, I had started this list um, a few years ago. It's about 49 different items that work 
Um, they're not as robust as the ones that we've shared. You know, they're not as evergreen. Um, bingo Baker is a really great way to do, you know, create your own bingo cards, Jeopardy Labs, etc. So there's a bunch of them here. I've tested them, you know, on iPad as well as on the web. So these are kind of one-hit wonders, but they're still good tools. And so if you want to check out just a few other things that are iPad-friendly web applications, those are there. I will tell you, the reason that we shared all of the tools that we shared today was that they are so open-ended and they are, you know, able to use them in K through 12, able to use them in any, you know, content area. And I feel like these sort of tools will give you a really great option for working with multiple devices. And I really like what Samantha mentioned. You know, some of these tools are really easy. I can just pick one and I can start using it on Monday. There was somebody who shared this idea of the two, 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 and it's the idea of I need to choose two tools that I can use, you know, in the next two days, two tools that I can use in the next two weeks, and two tools that I can use in the next two months. So don't feel overwhelmed by all of these and say, oh, there's so many of them and I don't know what to choose. You know, pick the one that you feel like speaks to you or the one that you feel like this is really something I could latch on to in May and work with that one. And then once you're ready, you know, you can kind of app smash and add different things um, onto it from there. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really yeah, good point is really don't try to do everything, to do everything, at, everything once. at once. You know, pick one, you know, pick one. And, um, and, and try to get to know it and, and see, you know, if it uses, if it works well for you, go ahead, keep using it, do some great things and share it, obviously, because that's how we all learn from each other. And if it doesn't, then scrap it and try something else. That's the wonderful thing about all these tools. It's a, there's a great variety. So not only does it tap into um, our, our students and their different learning styles, but I think they also tap into teachers and their um, different teaching styles, which is really fantastic. And I've got to say, I love that idea of using, um, was it, it was Trello, so, no, sorry, Common uh, Curriculum for helping out new teachers. Oh my gosh, I'm so stealing that idea because I didn't even think of it for some reason. And wow, that's and just a great idea. I mean, I, I work with new teachers all the time, and it is absolutely a fantastic idea. Um, so let me just, we have just a few minutes left. Let me just check. Um, yeah, so um, is there an elementary site for Trello, Lisa, or is it just the one Trello site and you make it simpler? Yeah, so it's just the one Trello site, um, and, and you can, like, customize the background, and you can do, you know, kind of whatever you want with it. This is just, so so this one has has goals ongoing completed. Normally, when you first log in, it's like to do ongoing completed. So, I mean, you can change these titles. You can add more of these if you, like, wanted five of these boards to kind of drag and drop and move around. Um, if it were a team of people, maybe you would have like, this is John's to-do list, this is so-and-so's, and you can mark them as completed, you can archive them. Um, so it's it's one tool, but, okay. you know, they, they kind of all thread together. That was one of our questions. That's great. Well, I've got to say, I'm, this was a fantastic webinar. I'm so glad I got to hang out with you, Lisa. Um, we, have, we have two more coming up. May 15th, we're going to be talking about Google Glass in the classroom with Courtney Pepe, who's been using them. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it will just, I think it'll just, it'll blow my mind. So it's so awesome. Just a great tool. And then May 19th for Scratch Day, we are going to be getting creative with Scratch, which is a program from MIT that can be used at, you know, most grade levels. Um, and it teaches coding and creative thinking. And it's just a fantastic tool. And of course, we do just want to mention um, our hands-on workshops this summer. You could uh, work with um, Lisa in, I think, you're, Lisa, you're in both Austin and Chicago or... Um, I know you're in a few of our workshops as well as I am, and I'm lucky enough, lucky enough that I will get to uh, get definitely to, uh, see there at our EdTech ed 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 where we're going to have a BYOD strand as well as several other strands that talk about you know the future of learning and where education is going and all of these fantastic ideas and it's just going to be a just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to learn and grow as educators. So I'm sorry, Lisa, which one are you going to, I know you're in Austin, which is going to be fantastic. Where else are you um, going to be? Yeah, so I'm going to be at, um, I'm going to be at both the Austin one as well as the uh, Chicago one. I, I can't off the top of my head remember what I'm presenting <laughs> right. at the Chicago one, um, but the Austin one is a three-day iPad workshop. I believe it's the 4th, the 5th, and the 6th. 
Well, that is just fantastic. I cannot wait to get a chance to work with you. So that'll be just wonderful. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat box and box at 8 o'clock on the dot. On the dot. So Lisa, I just, Lisa, I just again, again, fantastic. Um, and everybody, thank you for joining us, and hopefully we will get to see you this summer. And have a great evening.